The next speaker on the list is distinguished representative of Russian Federation. You have the floor, sir. Madam Chair, the Russian delegation is grateful to the Secretary General for his report envisaged by Resolution 71 stroke 145. The information under this agenda item, which states share with the Secretariat, makes it possible to clearly assess the state of affairs in terms of compliance with the provisions of international diplomatic and consular law. Our delegation is extremely concerned with the degradation over the last two years of the attitude of some states to these universally recognized norms. In particular, the acts of the U.S. authorities illustrate this. As we informed the U.N. Secretary General and the General Assembly in document A-72-948. stroke stroke The U.S. authorities referring to their national legislation, in particular the 1982 Foreign Missions Act, and the determinations of the U.S. Secretary of State adopted on its basis during the period from December 2016 to April 2018 took a range of provocative, hostile, coercive measures unprecedented in their scope and cynicism against a number of Russian official missions, their property, as well as the mission's staff, and their family members. These measures sought to expel Russian official missions, the mission's staff and their family members from the premises that they occupied on lawful grounds and aimed to cause damage to the sovereign digni dignity of the Russian Federation and moral damage to the staff of its official missions to disrupt the normal functioning of the diplomatic missions and consular establishments of the Russian Federation in the U.S. and to deny the Russian Federation access to the property it used for sovereign purposes. In particular, on the 29th of December 2016, the U.S. Department of State notified the Embassy of Russia on the withdrawal of consent to use a part of the premises of the embassy in Washington and part of the permanent mission to the United Nations in New York premises that are used for official purposes and the lifting of all of their privileges and immunities, as well as denial of access to the aforementioned premises from December 2016 for any persons including Russian representatives. And let us recall that these premises were used for official purposes for protocol events, the storage of archives, and as a residence for the embassy and the permanent missions personnel. The problem of a part of the permanent missions premises has therefore been under consideration of the Committee on Relations with the Host Country for two years. Further on, the Department of State announced through a note of 31 August 2017, the withdrawal of consent for the opening and functioning of the Russian Consulate General in San Francisco, the lifting of all its immunities and demand to cease all activities of the Consulate General, and it announced the denial of access to the staff area of the Consulate General for any persons, including Russian representatives, and a ban on keeping the archives in the said premises. With effect from the 1st of October 2017, Access was also denied to the other premises of the Consulate General, the residential section and the residence of the Consul General, all immunities of which were lifted from that same date. The same restrictions were taken with regard to the trade representation of Russia in Washington and its New York office, which form part of the embassy. In its note of 26 March 2018, the Department of State declared the withdrawal of consent to the opening and functioning of the Consulate General in Seattle, as well as of permission to use the relevant premises for diplomatic and consular purposes, as well as the lifting of all of their immunities and a ban on keeping archives in these premises. 
Madam Chair, the introduction of the aforementioned restrictive measures despite protests by the Russian side was accompanied by the forced entry of representatives of the U.S. authorities into the relevant premises with the breaking of locks, disabling of entry gates, conducting searches therein under the guise of so-called examinations or inspections, as well as engineering works not agreed with the Russian Federation, as a result of which the premises and the furnishings were dealt genuine damage, real damage, material damage. The Russian Federation emphasizes that it legally has the right of ownership or exercise the rights of tenant of the facilities specified above. Despite our regular requests via diplomatic channels to let us examine the aforementioned premises and to hold protocol events there, the Department of State has systematically refused to provide such access without any explanations, contrary to the notes of the Department of State, which provide for authorization procedures for visits by Russian representatives. Thus, we have been completely and for a long time deprived of any possibility of control over these facilities, access to them, exercise of the powers of the owner in respect of them. At the same time, representatives of the U.S. authorities regularly gain access to the premises mentioned without consent or notification of the Russian side. It turns out that the U.S. authorities have actually seized the aforementioned premises. Despite our protests, the U.S. authorities removed state flags of the Russian Federation from these premises. Moreover, there has been an infringement of the inviolability of the archives of the Consulate General, which incidentally contain personal data of applicants, U.S. and Russian citizens. With that, our permission, that archive was removed from the premises of the Consulate General by the U.S. authorities, packed into boxes by them and shipped to Washington, D.C. to be handed over to the embassy by the transport company engaged by the Department of State. To sum up, the actions of the U.S. authorities constitute a gross violation of the fundamental principle of diplomatic and consular law the principle of inviability of official premises and residences. These actions are incompatible with the UN Charter, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, the Russian-US Consular Convention of 1964, the United Nations Headquarters Agreement, and the Convention on Privileges and Immunities of the UN. Madam Chair, despite our protests, the U.S. government is not only not taking any measures to end its own unlawful conduct and resolve the situation, but in addition, it declares full compliance of its actions with national legislation. None of the persons involved has been held accountable. In other words, the U.S. authorities in their traditional manner are trying to present these events as something quite legitimate. But their explanations lead to a paradoxical conclusion. It turns out that the U.S. claims that the receiving state possesses a sole and absolute right to adopt unilateral measures to halt the activities of foreign diplomatic missions and consular establishments by arbitrarily lifting their immunities. This is followed by the ban on access of the accrediting state to the premises, including those possessing the right of ownership and the expulsion of staff members and their family from there, including private residences. Moreover, if we follow the US logic, these me measures could be taken under deliberately unacceptable conditions, not ensuring even the guarantees that should be provided by the accrediting state in case of war or breach of diplomatic relations. Thus, the US actions and argumentation dilute the very essence of diplomatic and consular representation and its fundamental principles. Madam Chair, it is more than evident that the consequences of the measures taken by the U.S. authorities go far beyond bilateral relations. 
and are capable of creating, creating an extremely undesirable precedent and causing serious damage to the entire system of international relations. In response to the unlawful authorities of the US, uh, actions of the US authorities, we were compelled to take certain countermeasures in full accordance with international law. We believe, however, that the assessment of the U.S.'s actions, including political ones, should be made in the United Nations. Otherwise, such actions could become a norm. Should any embassy or consulate be expelled within a matter of hours from their premises, and diplomats or consular officials, together with the members of their family, evict, including children, evicted from their private residences, and, and if that is considered natural, diplomatic and consular missions would not be able to operate normally as a matter of principle. Therefore, we deem it necessary to draw the attention of all states to the actions of the U.S. authorities, since in the absence of the collective condemnation, any one of them could become the next victim of such measures. Madam Chair. Let us recall that the agenda item under consideration today concerns the consideration of effective measures to strengthen protection, security and safety of diplomatic and consular missions and their representatives. Resolution 71-145 expresses the concern of the General Assembly with the non-compliance with the principle of inviolability of diplomatic and consular missions and their representatives and also contains a reminder regarding the inviolability of diplomatic and consular archives and documents breaking doors and locks and disabling entry gates of Russian diplomatic and consular facilities, and conducting searches and unagreed, uncoordinated engineering works as well as manipulation of the archives and getting their hands on the archives is a vivid example of violent and coercive measures that constitute a gross violation of inviolability and security let alone the fact that the officials and their family are evicted from their offices and residences. The fact that none of them suffered physical damage, physical harm, is a result of precautionary measures that we took ourselves under these extraordinary circumstances. The situation is overshadowed by the fact that all unlawful actions have been perpetrated not by some marginal elements, but rather by government agencies. Instead of ensuring security and safety of embassies and consulates on their territory, the host country has itself exerted enforcement and illegal intrusion on their premises, as well as other forceful measures. Madam Chair, Unfortunately, the arbitrary actions of the U.S. authorities do not close the problem. A bad example is, a con is contagious. Despite the special obligation of, of the receiving state to take all appropriate measures to protect the premises and employees of diplomatic and consular missions, they continue to be victims of assault. Two years ago, we reported the attacks of the Russian embassy and consulates in Ukraine. This year, we reviewed the so-called report of Kiev. Of course, we were impressed by the amount of data from the Ukrainian Unified Registry of Pretrial Proceedings concerning attacks against the Russian embassy and consulates. But we did not find any information there at all about the prosecution of perpetrators. Moreover, the attack on Russian diplomatic and consular missions in Ukraine, these attacks are continuing. On the 27th of September 2018, a group of Ukrainian right-wing radicals assaulted the trade mission of Russia, which has diplomatic status, in Kiev. Despite the fact that as a result of this mayhem there were no victims, the property was damaged. The CCTV cameras were broken, four cars parked near the fence, were splashed with dyes and sewage. In addition, registration plates were tor torn off and tyres punctured. The vandals left written threats on the gates of the mission and the embassy's cars. Smoked gr smoke grenades had been thrown onto the territory of the Russian facility as well. The patrol police and the National Guard officers 
who arrived at the scene simply calmly observed what was happening. A protocol report was drafted that described the damage that was done, and we hope that at least some investigative measure will be taken or were taken. We look forward to another petty fogging reply in the Unified Registry of Pre Trial Proceedings. Thank you for your attention. I thank the distinguished representative of Russian Federation for his statement.